Uh, Mike is now going to actually to show you in uh, real time how uh, an array can be added non-disruptively to an existing Can you board. imagine each array is a dual controller configuration, HA, and the two arrays there are effectively four controllers? That is right. So each array is oh. highly available by itself, has dual controllers, and one or more shelves. And when you say you can, you can cluster up to four is it four arrays? It is four arrays. Four arrays, so actually eight controllers. That's right. And it's only supporting iSCSI, is that? Today it's only supporting iSCSI. And, and also that the You don't have an open of, flow yeah. director network <laughs> there or <laughs> place like that, do you? I'll talk about uh, networking and, and data access later. OK. Yeah. Just check. All right, so um, I see some familiar no, faces. Uh, I think most of you were here last year. And if you remember the demo we did last year of the scale-up features of the flash and the CPU and the, and the storage shelves, um, I was running in and out of the room a lot. I was running over to our, our server room and literally changing out flash drives, changing out the controllers. And then I think we came back here and did the live connect the shelf button uh, at, at the meeting. So basically all of those things are sort of the scale-up aspect. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a brief walk into the scale-out aspect and my work today is actually going to be a lot easier, all right? And that, that's, I think that's one of the, the, the things I want you to kind of see here. Actually, operating this keyboard may be the hardest part. So if we go <coughs> this guy here. All right, so <coughs> I'm actually connected over to our remote lab, and we're running a, a nimble array here. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're, I'm not going to get into all the details on, on managing the nimble array. What I do is I want to show you the two key things that Inesh is going to dive into the, the, the sort of behind the scenes details. But on this particular array now, I have, or this management interface, I now have a manage arrays. And you can see down here, I actually have two arrays. All right, and I gave them some code names here, one and two. <clears throat> and you can see that there's- Imaginative. Pardon me? That were very imaginative names. Yeah, I, I, Fred and Barney will already take and a few others. but. Uh, uh, the thing is, so I have two arrays in this management interface, all right? Right now, they're operating independently, all right? And that's partly because I've set up two different storage pools. So that slide that was just up on the PowerPoint with the group and the arrays and the pools will make a lot more sense in just a moment. But what I want to do is I want to go One of the to, pools is zero, zero capacity? Is it's that? empty right now. Oh, it's not being used, but it's, not it's more, being used. more physical capacity. Okay, it's not physical capacity. You're looking at user yeah, this capacity. Yeah, is, this is actually what, so if we would look at you know, that's a good, the two things here. If we go to manage arrays, all right, physical capacity of each okay. of these are 15 terabyte. So these are basically uh, 440 arrays. These are three U, two, two separate units sitting in there. They were managed separately, and I basically put them into a scale-out group now. Oh, okay. But they're still sitting independently. All right, and I could choose to leave them this way and, and depending on what I want to do in my environment, but um, I want to take advantage of scale out. So what I'm going to do is actually take these two arrays and make them one common set of, of basically a consolidated pool of storage and performance. All right, and the way that I do that is I go up here to my manage pools, and these are the two new things in our, our new release, the two key things is groups of arrays and storage pools. And if I go to this default pool, now notice that the, the Cabo One pool is empty. It, it's a fresh array, it just showed up. I'm going to go to my default pool here, and I've got this volume sitting there that, that's running. And what we're actually running here is a, uh, an iometer workload, running about uh, some number of mixed I.O. workload to a single array. And I've connected it with the host side Nimble Connection Manager. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But the thing I want to point out here is it's this piece of the simplification, this piece of the, of the product, says that I have one array and two connections to it. So I, I have a, a redundant multipath connection from this host to one array in my group of two arrays. All right. So that was the way things got set up. I'm going to come back now to my nimble environment, and I'm going to say merge the pools. And I want to merge this other pool in. All right. So I just click merge. And I'm pretty much done. All right. So what's going to happen at this point, and I'm going to let Inesh drive into the details, is behind the scenes, the two arrays are basically going to become one storage pool for performance and capacity. So my two 15 terabyte arrays are going to present the 30 terabyte default pool. All right. I don't have to do anything on the host right now. 
All right, that window that I showed you with the one array, two connection, is, is going to be talking to the array, and it's going to find out that this other array joined the scale out cluster, and I will see two arrays and four connections show up. I should see my, my uh, workload increase. The, the throughput should, should begin to go up as the new array comes into service. I'm going to turn control back over because it only takes a few minutes, but uh, I wanna, for the sake of time, what I basically want to show is we now are running one default pool here. All right? It's going to begin merging in the background, and this host here, the array count and connections will change. So as things get moving in the background, and we'll come back and refresh those screens, we should have a larger pool with higher capacity, more connections, and the workload to it should begin scaling up. Or scaling out, I guess, is the, the right word here. So like I said, last year I was doing a lot of running back and forth, moving hardware parts, scaling up a 200 to 400 system. That's scale out. Are the, are, are the iSCSI volumes still locked to a particular, is there one pool or two pools at this point? There's there, one pool. There is one pool with two arrays in it right now. Uh, okay, I think this question is a better term. Are the iSCSI volumes locked to an array? No, the volume is that, th those are the details that are that are that, are, that we've got really good pictures to go through all of that. Good pictures. But, so, so the thing so I want to do is change the dynamic of the multi-piting yeah. of the iSCSI connections. Yes. Yeah. Without reconfiguring anything on the host. Right. So these two paths right here. Well, if I go click refresh, it'll basically pick up the other paths here very shortly. So this is all happening in the back as the arrays are joining. All I need no to disruption do or anything. You can do it in production. Yeah, it's it's running live. So all one share virtual IP for all the arrays. Can you join two existing arrays that have their own volumes? That's a good question, and yes, we can. So in this case, it's so when is it going to re-level the data empty. then? Sorry? Are you going to re-level the data? Yes. So if yes. a volume resides on one array <laughs> and the other volume on the other, okay, thanks. Yeah, sir. yeah, and I'll cover more of that. Yeah, these are the, these are the pictures. It's a lot easier to explain what's happening now. Yeah. With can you can you do the same thing? Can you move uh, uh, an array in and out of group without losing data? Yes, what then that would take the form of is two it's groups split. merging, and we support groups merging as well, absolutely. In fact, some of our customers today, before scale out, had such arrays, which were two separate, not just pools, but groups. And we have provided the ability to merge such arrays into a single group and a single pool. And okay. you can split them out as well, or no? Splitting, I believe, is not supported today. but is something that, that we are working on. Yeah. Yeah. I think the ability that we do have is the ability to evacuate an array. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you can already, yeah. Yeah. maybe we can yeah. demonstrate that. There's the enough end. time at the end we can. So basically moving into a new pool, uh, without a That's right. That's right. <coughs> yeah. I, yeah. I can't imagine why you'd want to evict an array and say, and take these volumes with you. That's right. It's, <laughs> but but we, it's not, yeah. it's conceptually. Uh, Splitting a sub or something like yeah. that. Have them, have them in a single side first and then move one to another side. Then why do you, but then it becomes why do you combine them into one volumes. pool? Two different arrays yeah, sure. in the same. Uh, so regardless, you know, yeah. one yeah. could argue You're about, about the use case. Right, but then you wouldn't direction. have combined them in the yeah. first place. Okay. It's conceptually possible and we'll have it. So what I want to do here is show why pooling is so useful in the first place. So if we didn't have pooling, then uh, the user might have an array that's mostly full and another array that's mostly empty. And we've all been there. <laughs> yes, now the user has to manually move some date, some volume from the full to the empty array, right? So that's both a management plane but also generally requires taking the application down because it does not happen live. One alternative would be to use something like VMware Storage vMotion, possibly with storage uh, DRS, which um, figures out whether rebalancing needs to happen. And that's in concept live and automatic. But I know that in practice, it is heavyweight. It has enough impact on, uh, on the performance that most users run it in manual mode. Even in automatic mode, it's not 
real time because the worst thing you want to do is go, that pool is overloaded and I need more IOPS, so let me add more load to it to move the data someplace else. <laughs> yeah, but that's temporary, right? Is <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to, you, you want to you notice, I mean, the way, the way I use storage DRS, you notice that it's overloaded, and then later when it comes down, you That's move right. it. That's right. Exactly. Right. Is each array a separate RAID group kind of thing? Is that, or is it is a RAID group then spread across when they're merged? A RAID group is uh, generally within an array, okay. in fact, on a shelf. But I'll talk about how data might be distributed across arrays. So a simple way of rebalancing space usage across arrays within a pool would be to take each volume and have the system select which array it should reside on. And by doing the proper selections, the system can roughly balance the space usage. So for example, this is what NetApp does with, his, with, with the cluster mode. Do I understand is right that we can have some performance models and capacity models in a pool and that you move hot and cold data over the models? So uh, I'll come to that later, but um, generally when, when rebalancing, it's better to focus on space usage rather than I.O. Because I.O. can be very fickle and you can end up chasing your tail. Uh, and also if you do the space usage balancing well, then the I.O. would follow. And I'll, I'll talk about how. So, so you know, the, the mode I was talking about with placing whole volumes within each array and selecting the array to place a volume, that, that's a simple mechanism. But has the problem that the performance of each volume is limited to the array that it resides in because it's confined to that array. Now, one might say, oh, you know, you don't really need a single volume to go beyond what the whole array can provide. But the problem really exists with multiple volumes as well. So, for example, you might know that two of these volumes are hot at any given time, but you cannot tell which two. So there's no way to optimally partition the set of volumes statically, because there's a 50-50 chance that the hot volumes might be on the same array. So one way or another, this model runs into performance hotspots. The other problem, somewhat more subtle, is that e even though the system might balance the volumes at one point in time, as the volumes grow, and they generally grow at different rates because of thin provisioning and snapshots, etc., as they grow at different rates, the system might not stay in balance. In fact, you know, for example, if the blue volume here, by the way, each, as you might have guessed, each uh, colored box here is a data volume or a LUN. Okay. And uh, you know, let's say now that the blue volume happens to be growing the fastest. Okay, so at some point, the system would need to rebalance again and perhaps move the red volume off. Okay. So there's this continual need for rebalancing, which impacts performance. What we do is uh, take each volume and slice it across all the arrays within the pool. And that is more complex to engineer because um, you know, it now means that we have to keep track of where the data is uh, across all the arrays. And also operations like snapshots now are no longer local operations. A snapshot needs to be taken consistently across all the arrays in the pool. Oh, so you got network latency considerations in taking this, okay. I think it's, it's still manageable, it's just take, it's yeah, more it's, complex from an engineering point of view. Yeah. But it, it then gives us the benefits that now, you know, there are no performance hotspots. Each volume can make use of all of the hardware resources uh, across all the arrays in the pool, you know, CPUs, uh, the flash caches, uh, disks, uh, memory networking, all of that. And also it avoids the um, need for frequent rebalancing because as volumes grow, if you are slicing in a manner that is fine-grained enough, then 
chances are that the growth will be proportional across the arrays. So what's and the grain? Is, sorry? So what's the grain? What's the what? You, you said if it's fine-grained enough. Uh, so what's the granularity? What's the granularity? Uh, in our case, it's a few megabytes, because that a, a slice is a few megabytes. Okay. Uh, and we chose that such that it's large enough to leverage uh, locality on disk within each system, uh, but small enough not to create hotspots in capacity or performance. So what happens if one of the arrays goes down for whatever reason? So uh, if an array goes down within a pool, uh, you're screwed. The, the, <laughs> the whole pool goes down. But we have designed it such that each array is, is highly available. So it has dual controllers, no single point of failure. Software updates are non-disruptive. Um, so a lot of engineering has gone into it. In, in fact, in terms of availability for a single array, uh, we have crossed five nines. So five nines is something that uh, you know, vendors aspire to uh, and, and often not get to. Um, it's, it's about five minutes of downtime in a year, and we measure our availability across all the systems in the field, and that measure of availability uh, is, is already beyond five nines at this time. So given that we believe that we can scale to a certain number of arrays within a pool without having too much concern about about loss of availability <coughs> on a pool-wide basis. Now, if we scale to much higher number of arrays within a pool, okay, let's say hundreds of arrays within a pool, then it would, uh, it would become more important to, to be able to survive an array going down as a whole. And at that time, we would need to look at how to have cross-array redundancy uh, to be able to Is the that. mapping of like a logical black address fixed to a particular array once the configuration is there? Yeah. Uh. So, so basically, <laughs> the slices that I was talking about, yeah. the you know, multi-megabyte slices, they are distributed across the arrays based on the logical address. And there's a mapping from that logical address to the array number. Right. Except we use um, uh, something similar to what is called consistent hashing. Consistent hashing is a technique that's used for um, for web caching, it, it was developed during the late 90s for web caching, where the hashing part means that there's a mathematical function, so you don't have to explicitly store a mapping for each slice. The map is, 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 is actually small and fixed size, regardless of the number of slices. And the consistent part here means that it's more sophisticated than a simple form of hashing. So a simple hashing might be, let's say, you use uh, mod the number of arrays. Okay, so here I've shown what would happen if we took the slice number and took the mod of n, where n is the number of arrays. In that case, if you add a new array, then it would change. n would change. You know, mod, from mod 3, it would go to mod 4. And now you have to and, move all the data. And then you, now you have to shuffle most of the blocks because the two hashes are different. But the consistent hashing is a, is a form where most of the uh, slices stay put, and only a small number of slices you know, flow to the new array. Okay. And, so, and this is a hash of the slice number, not, a, not the content, right? That's right. Yeah. It's a hash of the slice number. <clears throat> okay. The other thing we have done is made sure that, you know, although there is a slice map, the block map, which is at a much finer grain granularity, you know, at the level of uh, each block is a few kilobytes, the block map remains local to each array. What this means is that there is no need for a centralized service that, that knows where all the blocks are. So this is a problem in some implementations of um, parallel NAS, for example, parallel NFS, where there's a metadata service that keeps track of where the blocks are, and that metadata service can become a bottleneck. But in our case, by making sure that the block map is local to each array, uh, you know, we have made sure that it, 
uh, is decentralized and does not become a bottleneck. So when an I.O. comes into, like, let's say, Array 1 and needs to go out and access or write uh, block 18, which is an Array 3 in this case, it hops from one array to the other? Or? Okay. So oh, God. let me talk about that. <laughs> uh, get back to the slide I skipped. So, later. <laughs> so yeah, that's a good question. Now, now that the data is distributed, how do you, uh, how do you access it? Um, so the very simple thing to do would be to point the host to one of the arrays in the pool. The host connects with that array. And to have which, that array forward. Which instantly forward, becomes a single point of failure. <laughs> it, it, that is true. And also, the network links could become a bottleneck. <laughs> it's actually not as bad as it might seem, because in that mode, you're still leveraging all of the disks across all the pools, all of the flash, all of the CPU, and all of that. Okay. So better than that is to have the host connect to each of the arrays in the pool okay, in parallel and then forward the IOs either randomly or using round robin or least queue depth uh, to, to one of the arrays or across all the arrays. So they're still forwarding uh, in this approach. Uh, you know, so whatever uh, uh, IO does not belong to the array itself would get forwarded to the right array. Uh, but it has the advantage that you're now using all of the network links. And in fact, we provide a utility that runs on the host that uh, lets the user create a single connection to a single virtual IP address. And that utility then takes that single connection and multiplies it, multiplies the connections and fans them out across all the arrays automatically. So in that example that uh, Mike showed, that, that would happen as we'll see. Uh, okay. So better than parallel access still is to be able to send the data directly to the array that mm -hmm. holds, holds the data. Um, and uh, that uh, can be done by sharing the slice map that I was talking about with, with the host. So it helps here to keep that slice map small. And uh, we leverage uh, this uh, generic facility in the IO stack as part of MPIO, which is multipathing a file, uh, where the, the storage um, uh, vendor can install a plugin, which can help direct the IOs directly to the arrays that hold the data. So you have your MPIO driver? That's right. We have an MPIO plugin. Uh, that for which system? Uh, we have the plugin for Windows okay. and for so VMware ESX. Ah, OK. So you have and, your, your and own PSP That's right. Drive. Okay. In the context of yeah, VMware, VMware, it is yeah. a PSP, path selection something. Plugin. Plugin, plugin. Yeah. right. So the, right. So the PSP runs the same hash function to figure out who has the data? That's right. OK. And then? And it actually gets some of the parameters for the hashing. From the array? From the array. OK. Right. Um, and so, if I'm, so for parallel access, I need software from you running on the host. Parallel access, you could create. Um, the user could create the parallel connections manually. Right. But we provide a utility that would simplify that job. Okay. So the user doesn't have to make each of the connections to each of the arrays. Okay. But if I, if I just create one connection, you're not doing IP redirects the way, say, Equalogic does? The way it works in Equalogic is similar to the way we work here, which is that uh, the Connections, when they go to the virtual IP address, right. get redirected or fanned right. out yeah. to all of the arrays. So it's also just like left end. Right? I'm not sure how it uh, works. Uh, OK, we have Maybe. virtual IP. You have one uh, master host, say, is responsible for the virtual IP, and then you redirect the other host, yes. right? Okay. I think yeah. It's yeah. yeah, and this and Equalogic is a distributed master that everybody replies to the virtual IP address. Yeah. and and 
the first guy who looks at it goes, that's not mine, talk to him. Okay. Well, there are only three per LUN, right? Is that still a limitation? I, I'm not sure, but it... I'm, I'm not sure either, but... Yeah. Well, that is actually a follow-up question I had. If you have, so you have four dual controller uh, nodes maximum in that pool. Um, do you see then 16 paths going to a single LUN? That depends on how many paths we make to each array. Is the is a LUN pool. striped over every single node? It the LUN is striped over all the nodes, all the arrays okay, within a pool. So you will see it, you will see sixteen paths then. You should you're not going to see six you're not going to see sixteen so, paths so, right? So, um, that's a question. Number of paths depends <laughs> on the the number of volumes, as well as so it's in our control as to especially with with our utility as to how many connections or paths we create from the host to each array. So, for example, you could create just one path to each array, and then you would see only four, but that would not be very fault tolerant if that path goes out. So we create as many paths as the number of interfaces on the host, but we keep a minimum of two. Okay, so you would see at least eight paths in that case. So you could see 16. Hmm? And you could see 16. Yeah, to uh, make the connection from the host smarter, uh, so it can communicate directly with the array, which block resides where. That's right. So there are two different parts here. There is a connection creator utility, which creates multiple connections, and f yeah. right. So that's what helps with parallel access. And then there is another part, which also runs on the host that selects the right path. So one creates the paths, and the other selects the right path on a per I.O. basis. I, one of the things that strikes me is, as you're talking about this, you, you top out at four, four nodes right now, as you mentioned before. And it's, there's some irony in the scale to fit doesn't scale beyond four nodes. Uh, is, that, is that intentional in where you're, you want to play in the market, or ultimately, is this sort of just an interim step to get to some level of scale while you work on a mechanism that can get you to go further beyond four nodes? Or am I smoking crack? On? I don't I see it is, it is actually an iSCSI over 60 nodes. Well, that's why I'm asking the question. Okay, so multiple things there. Uh, it's very much a starting step. Okay. The design already is in place for scaling to tens of nodes, if not higher. So this is basically sort of a, the first step, uh, the first little lily pad you got to walk on to get That's across right. the pond. Absolutely. You know, we, you know, in terms of how we, you know, we want to QA a limited configuration to begin with and then support that and then move on to supporting larger number of arrays within a... Is, is it safe to say that at some point in the future you will have the ability to lose a node? That's right. So as we go to very large number of nodes, we would then need to account for the fact that a whole node, despite being highly available by itself, might go down. If you have hundreds of nodes, for example, that probability uh, becomes important. Maybe, maybe just to add, you know, you can, if you look at the evolution, before we had scaling, you know, one system would be 36 raw terabytes last year. Right. If now no, you've, got, now you've got essentially 16 of those, right, four by four, as we talked right. about before. So now you've got a cluster that can operate at you know hundreds hundreds of thousands of IOPS and north of 600 terabytes. So if you look at that d dimension scaling, that's a huge step. Absolutely. And as Umesh said, the next phase will be scaling that. To oh, the and next I'm not. Level. I, this is not commentary. But that on, was just kind of the clear step. This is not commentary on. The, you've only gone this far. Believe me, I, this is good because no, but in, in the uh, hybrid space, this is unique. Um, you know, as far as getting to a well, those are the guys we saw this morning. But well, other yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or it's, it's I shouldn't say uh, unique, but it was unique until you know, uh, so the new this morning new, until this morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, obviously to get to the large enterprise, it's it, there's I would assume that's that's the next direction. Then, as Amesh said, that's where some yeah. of the future. The, will the problem though is if if you're going to allow node failure, you have to introduce a lot more data redundancy. I, mm -hmm. I, yeah, absolutely. No question. No question. That's why I was asking the question about if this was just step one of many to get there. So. <laughs> I, want, I want to go back 
to another aspect of slicing, which is that the system is, is designed to be able to rebalance the slices as needed. And the goal here is to keep uh, the space usage balanced across all the nodes. You know, an alternative would be to go after I.O. and try to balance I.O., but that is, at least in the, over short periods of time, I.O. is too fickle of a metric you to go after. And over longer periods of time, if the slicing is done at a fine grain level, then, then I.O. load follows space usage. So the arrays have to be, do they have to be uh, homogeneous size and stuff like that to be the same size? No, so we do not require the arrays to be of the same size or even to have the same controllers. They can have different capacities. Okay. And then the rebalancing would aim to fill them proportionately. The same proportion, yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, we recommend that the arrays have the same performance to capacity ratios. That's when they work the best together. Oh, so you, you do not use some kind of tiering, like this array can handle more performance, I move hot blocks there? No, just for that you would it's create just balancing different pools. On volume. If, you were to, if you wanted to do that, you would create different pools within a group. So you could say, okay, here's a pool with a single array, it is particularly good with flash. Oh, but that, what you say there is moving whole volumes. What I say is moving hot data within a volume to a higher capacity node, a higher performance capacity node. So within a pool, the, the system will, will balance the slices uniformly. On volume. Okay, yes. Okay, so, so the system has the ability to rebalance, but it's, uh, it's like a tool that you want to keep in your back pocket and not use it much. Because when you rebalance data, you're moving data from one place to another, uh, has some impact. So when you cluster the, the arrays together, it's a single pool that you end up with? Is that, you're merging all the pools into one, effectively? The user has a choice when, uh, I'm not sure whether this was your question, but if you are, for example, let's say um, there are two separate groups, each with some number of arrays. Let's say, you know, the, uh, uh, one has two arrays within a pool, another has three arrays within a pool. Well, in this case, you know, we support only four. Let's say one has one and the other has three. When they are trying to merge the group, the two groups, the user has a choice of keeping them as separate pools or merging the pools. As well. So remember that we make a distinction between a group and a pool. A group is for administering, and the pool is that storage container. Not sure if I asked if I answered your, your question. So when, when you cluster multiples array, arrays together, you effectively are constructing a single pool across all the arrays and you're slicing the, the uh, you're hashing the slices across all the arrays. That's and that, right. The user has the a pool. choice. If they want, they could keep them. They don't the have to merge them if they don't want to. But it, in order to merge them, you get, you get the benefits of you know, cluster uh, performance, you know, more spreading of the, of the IO activity across the arrays and that sort of stuff. If you want that, you're, generating, you're, you're creating a single pool that, that spans all those arrays. That's right. So th that's a good point. So you know, I was saying that rebalancing is something that we, don't, that we want the system to be capable of, but not to do very often. And we have made it, designed it such that pretty much the only time rebalancing has to be done is when new arrays are added to a pool, or if an array is removed from a pool. So there are other times when rebalancing might have been needed. You know, I was talking about how if rebalancing were working at a very coarse granularity, placing whole volumes in, into arrays, then just, you know, just writing data to volumes, that, that normal usage, could cause volumes to grow at different rates and cause a need for rebalancing. But with slicing at a fine granularity, we avoid that need. So rebalancing pretty much happens only when arrays or shelves are being added or removed. And that's, that's generally very infrequent. So uh, it's inf infrequent, but also you know, it's, it's automatic. The user doesn't have to do uh, anything to trigger it. Uh, 
And it's also live in the sense that reads and writes could be happening while the rebalancing is going on. And, and that's challenging. It's like changing horses midstream. And the general way you do it is that you mirror the, the data that needs to be migrated from one array to another. You create a mirror of that data. And, that, and when that mirror is up to date with the source, then you switch. So this is how some of the other migrations also work. For example, um, I was talking about VMware storage vMotion. And it does that at a whole volume level or a virtual disk level, uh, which creates a lot of duplication of space and needs to mirror a whole bunch of writes. All of the writes going to any part of the volume need to be mirrored. Whereas uh, we are able to do it in uh, a piecemeal fashion. So uh, only um, you know, small installment of, of slices get moved around. And that's where the switching happens between one array and the other. So both it's more incremental, takes less space, does not duplicate space, does not mirror all the rights. And also the handoff is very smooth. Uh, there are other approaches or other solutions where uh, the data is moved. Um, you know, the, the problem with moving data is that as you're moving data, new writes might come in, which also need to be reflected to the other side. And you might have a multi-phase approach here, each phase uh, replicating the data that came in during the previous phase. And then typically there is a last phase for which you have to stall the writes. It's generally very small, but there's a hiccup. And, and we have figured out an algorithm that avoids <coughs> that last hiccup. Speaking of, do you guys support replication, remote replication of the storage? That's right. In so, a cluster environment? So the way it works is the replication repli replicates data, replicates snapshots from one replicate group snaps. to another. And, and it can work across groups that are very dissimilar. So you might have on one side a group with four arrays, on the other side a group with two arrays, different capacities, performance points, and then you can replicate uh, a volume from one to the other and also other volumes back from the second to so the third. So the replication requirement is basically it's nimble to nimble. That's what you're That's saying. True. Okay. You expect a nimble EMC? Or? And I think that make, makes it clear, you know, whatever to whatever, as long as it's nimble. Yeah. Well, if there were a standard protocol, <laughs> uh, and I wish there were uh, for things to be open, uh, that would work. But there isn't a standard replication protocol. Sure. Okay. So, and who do we blame for that? You mentioned snapshots. Do snapshots read write or read only or? Uh, snapshots are read write. We call the writable snapshots clones. Yeah. So that's what I snapshot have. in a cluster takes takes place across all the arrays that have the data. Yeah, so a snapshot is a distributed operation across all the arrays within a pool. In fact, on top of that, we support well, we have always always supported the notion of um, consistency set. So it's a set of volumes that can be snapshot together. So you can imagine, um, for example, with uh, a database or exchange that there is a database volume and a log volume that you want to snapshot together. And we have made it such that volumes within a consistency set can reside on different pools within a group. So you might put your database volume in a high performance pool with multiple arrays and your log volume in let's say a low latency uh, pool which has a single array uh, and still be able to snapshot these two volumes together in a consistent way. Okay, but I can't create, you know, an all, I can't create an all spinning disk or an all flash pool, right? That's always a hybrid. It's hybrid. No. You can vary the amount of flash to disk ratio, but our system relies on the fact that 
it has a combination of these two. Okay, but so I can create a, a, a high performance, more flash pool and a low performance, less flash pool. Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. So you can have two different pools with different. But the yeah, because the log files, you know. Yeah, yeah, but the volume resides in a pool. Yeah. Right. So the so the database goes in a mostly flash pool and the log goes in a mostly disk pool because it's Wrong. all sequential writes and I don't care. So just okay. to and and then yeah. um, lower granularity per VM snapshots. You're waiting for VVALs and your prints to come. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Good I, I, I will repeat the question yeah. and leave half the snark out. Okay. <laughs> so for per VM snapshots, you're waiting for VVALs. Uh, that is right. Okay. The my prints will come part was just snark. Okay, so and everything is thin provisioned and all that is part of the system. Yes, yes, volumes are thin provision, you know, snapshots, uh, share blocks. Right. Um, highly efficient snapshots, thin provisioning is the also. Deduplication is not in the system. There is compression in the system, not data deduplication. compression? Yes. Yeah. In fact, all of the data is compressed by default. And this is hardware or software compression? It's, it's software compression. The challenge with compression now is not that of the <laughs> CPU load it puts, because you have, have the CPU cores, but it's a matter of data layout. So, you know, after compression, you have variable size blocks. And the question is, how do you fit these variable size blocks? Log structure file, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just so. a guess. <laughs> See, and he hasn't even been at the previous field days. Okay, so, slide? sorry? Is that the last slide? Yes, that, that is the last slide. So, let's see. Uh... And this is GA now, the clustering capability, or is coming out soon, or? Clustering is, scale out is released, but it's not GA yet. What does that mean? It means it's. <laughs> it means you can only get it if you ask really nice. Yep. It's like a beta <laughs> version of no, it? No, it's not a beta. It's, beta. it's being it's used released. for production. Controlled introduction. But, but directed we, we controlled the rollout. Some people would call it or something like that? Yeah. Soft open. <laughs> How many pools could you have in a group? Did I miss that? So uh, today there can be four arrays in a group. In a pool. And you could, you could create a pool for each array. So there can be then four pools in a group. Oh. So it's. Okay. So there can be maximum big. four nodes. Yeah. And four pools. No, right. well, four mm -hmm. arrays in a pool, but also four arrays in a group. Yes, there can be yeah. four arrays in a group. Okay. And each of them could be in a separate pool. And, mm -hmm. you know, regarding the question that you asked earlier, one could imagine later, even if you want to limit the extent of pooling, you could still have a larger group. Yeah. Right. Because a group yeah. is for administering purposes. And the group is a management construct, effectively, more than, than anything else. It doesn't actually spread slices across groups or anything like so that. That's what, right. What is the reason why you cannot have four groups today with four pools? Because there's nothing in the data landing handled beyond the pool, right? It's only management of the Yeah. Of yeah. The pool. So, you, so I, what's I guess the what you're asking you, is why perhaps we could not have a single group with four pools, each with four yes. arrays. Yes, that's the right? question. Uh, it, it is easier to scale, definitely, and it's just how we are starting out. Yeah. Like we are starting out with a group of up to four arrays. So what's happening in, in a group? Uh, in a group, uh, not anything that you know, cannot scale further. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a single point of user interface. Mm -hmm. Uh, networking is shared, a single set of virtual IPs. Um, the, the, so there are some abstractions that cut across the whole group. The uh, notion of a consistency set of volume. So when a snapshot is taken, uh, it indeed can span the whole group. Snapshots can span. So, so snapshot a snapshot. Can span pools? Uh, a snapshot is taken on a volume collection, uh, which includes can include multiple volumes. I was talking about you're saying consistency group snapshots. That's right. Okay. 
So, okay. but I'll, but oh, in oh. in what I could create a group and create a pool that's across arrays one and two, and a pool that's a great across arrays three and four, and a third pool that's across all four arrays, right? No, no, no. So an array can be part of a single pool. Uh. So it's ah. a physical pool. Okay. We asked this that question. One, one array, one pool. Yeah. One array is part of only one pool. Okay. However, that pool can yeah. span multiple arrays. It's actually before... Uh, oh, it's a mic. one to many, not a many to many. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> just, just want to wrap up uh, a few things about scalability. Um, <sighs> so, you know, we have scale up, we have scale out. Uh, and with scale out, we have worked quite hard to provide pools which are single, you know, which provide uh, consolidation for both capacity and performance. So for many other solutions, you know, they would support consolidation of capacity, but not of performance. Now, each array would still be uh, serving uh, volumes <coughs> separately. And so, so we provide the consolidation of performance as well. And in fact, it, it scales pretty linearly, as you will see. So I'm, I, I actually expected Imesh to take just a little shorter in, <laughs> in his section here. Okay. The, the, it, no, it's okay. The test was running for, the, for, for basically an hour. Um, the connection manager, remember it was one array, two connections. I did a real quick refresh here. I now have two arrays in the count and four connections um, on this particular volume. All right. So I didn't do anything. I just literally let it happen in the background. Um, on the array itself, we can see here... <clears throat> the workload, um, when we were kind of starting off here at around 1.30, running into the, uh, the meeting here, um, I got an opportunity right around here to press that button. Okay? The arrays kind of did their things. Some bin maps were changing. All of the stuff. Did it match it? And we took a small L little, little bump here flip. Yeah. Of, of let me start moving some data <laughs> all right, and started getting things onto the other array in this pool. And then we see literally the, the, the typical climb up through, my, through the migration, the, the merge process here. And now I'm running uh, r roughly about 2x um, where I was here before. And this last little cliff here is, is, is the very traditional cache acceleration magic point that hybrid storage just has sort of that boom effect. Right. So we can see here that literally so the iometer is running in the background uninterrupted. This was a little, little blip right here for about a minute while it was... Uh, Figuring out what was going on. The 20 all gigabyte the, volume that we're talking about here? This, yeah, this was just a little 10, 10, 20, 10 gig volume, something with data in it. So the, the data is moving in the background. We're not trying to show uh, the merge process as a primary activity in your business. The merge process is intended to happen in the background, and the applications that are writing to it get advantage from it. So literally, as soon as it figured out the second array was in there, I started to see performance climb on both read and write behavior to the point that I'm back here. And then from a simplicity perspective, like I said, I go back to the host. I've got multiple connections now. This application can now push harder. How much SSD in each of the arrays? Uh, these ones are, uh, these, let me, I gotta check the configuration, I'm sorry. This is the, uh, the arrays, I believe these are 440 GX4s, X2s. So these are 440 GX4s, which means they're 400 series controllers, two terabyte drives, and they've got about two terabytes of flash on each one. So, and this is a very typical kind of experience, regardless of the workload on the system. Now, I just happen to have one simple, you know, uh, client basically connecting to it. But anybody connecting to this array, when that pool was merged between the two, the connection manager would, would basically give them more paths, more array, more horsepower. This is with the MPIO plugin sitting on, on yeah. the, the host. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I could go back here to my host if I wanted to and, um, and deal with the iSCSI initiator and the MPIO settings and all the proper networking mappings. That's all done for you by the uh, Nimble Connection Manager here. And if, can you humor me for one more second? Just, just for grins, if I wanted to, I could go here to the storage pools. And... Um, like I said, on time here, if I pick this particular storage pool, I could go here, for example, and choose to take this array out of the pool. And I think you all, and I, literally two clicks, I'll go away. What's going to happen? The arrays are going to separate, and my client is basically going to dip back down to his original meeting 
performance levels, and the other array can then be used for whatever. So this idea of seamlessly bringing them in and out of a, of a scale-out pool with, like you said, I didn't have to leave the room. I mean, very easy for me from an administrator's perspective of managing the assets here. Leave that? Or do you want me to keep it? I, I'm, I'm done. My, my slot's done now, so. All right, thanks. Look at the usage, it's just about 50 50 across those two arrays, right? Yeah, and, th and there may be some, it might be still be doing some balance, oh, almost. Yeah. So 4.97 versus 4.88. So we're almost at 50 50. So this, little, right this now. little 10 gig volume took just a, literally a few minutes to, to spread out. It's not, that's not the purpose of, of the merge. And it's now uniformly sitting on these two like arrays. 